response to. My name is Marty McGinn. I'm one of the deacons here at uh, Cross Point. And uh, several weeks ago, well, several months ago, David mentioned, hey, I want you to preach one Sunday. I said, okay, you got it. Just let me know when. Didn't hear anything. And then about three weeks ago, I get a text, hey, call me. And I called him. He says, hey, I got you on the docket to preach on July 30th. I said, okay, I guess that means I'm up. And as it says in 2 Timothy, as Paul wrote in Timothy, you know, it says, in a cha- it says he tells us to be ready in season, out of season. So hopefully um, I'm in season, I guess. But anyway, as we come together today, it's a, I'm happy to be with you, glad to be here. Look forward to the opportunity that God's given us to join together and study his word. But as we see the video just then, we, uh, we see I love my church. And I know people love this church. You know how I know? It's because I saw these kids up here this morning. And I saw what God is doing through those. If you work with DPK, if you're one of those people who go up there with Keith and the group up there, and you work with DPK, I want you to stand up right now. I want you to stand up if you're still here. I know a lot of them left, but if you work with DPK, all right, don't, there's one. If you work with DPK at all, I, they deserve a hand, really. I mean, to see, to see people who love kids, to see people who love their church, I mean, um, and, and to make disciples and making these disciples, how exciting is that? So as we know, we're in the, the series called I Love My Church. I love my church, and uh, I get to do the one on making disciples. That's what Pastor David asked me, and, and, and the title of the sermon today is Making Disciples, but I t- titled it Discipleship, dot, dot, dot. It's not optional. To start out, I just want us to look at something. I want us to look at the mission statement. Last week, uh, two weeks ago, Pastor David talked about why the local church matters. Last week, Pastor Darren talked about we're on a mission. And so we looked at the mission statement. I think it's important. The reason you love your church, we need to look at that reason. So let's look at what it says. And the the mission statement for Cross Point Church is this. Cross Point Church is a contemporary church with a casual environment where people can develop an authentic relationship with God. Is a place to discover Jesus Christ through relevant messages, passionate worship, and caring relationships, as well as make him known throughout the world. So there's a few things I want to point out. There's, the, the first thing is contemporary. It's, you know, we are conservative in our theology, but we are progressive in our methodology. And I, I like that because the Word of God does not change. The Word of God does not change, but you've got to change with the world of how you reach the world. You can't do it the way they did 2,000 years ago. You can't stone people if they don't come to know Christ. So, Not that they did that, but I'm just saying, you can't do that. If you do love Christ, you can't get stoned. But Cross Point is contemporary. It's casual. Last time I preached, I had to put on a coat and tie and tuck my shirt in. This is, like, sort of nice. I get my shirt tail out, got my boots on. I feel comfortable. The next thing is I want to point out is it says where people can develop. This is, where, this is where I want you to look at yourself. You can develop an authentic relationship with God. You can. It's a choice. Everyone in here, including myself, we have a choice. We can choose to develop and grow in Christ, or we can choose to not develop and grow in Christ. Choices are always made, whether positive or negative. You always have you, your choices in life, and the consequences will always be either positive or negative. It'll be a positive choice or a negative choice. So, and I say that because it's your choice. So you can develop an authentic relationship. It goes on and it talks about through relevant messages. Hopefully this is relevant today. We've already had passionate worship with the kids. We already had passionate worship with the worship team. And caring relationships. This church cares. This church cares about one another. This church cares about the community. This church cares about reaching the world for Christ. So as we, as we look at this, what, what is discipleship? What is discipleship? Well, the best way to figure out what a disciple is or discipleship is is you've got to have a definition. So I looked up the world, you know, just a regular dictionary, and the d- definition that was given was this. The standard definition of disciple, which is a noun, is someone who adheres to the teachings of another. It is a follower or a learner. It refers to someone who takes up the ways of someone else. So it's a, it's a follower or a learner or refers to someone who takes up the waves of, ways of someone else. The world has sort of taken, disciple was really, it's, it's a biblical term as we know, but the world has taken this and started applying it in different ways because I'm a huge football fan. And, and so when you're watching a football game, you'll hear like they'll say Lincoln Riley, he's a disciple of how mummy, he's a disciple of this. And I say that because 
So the air raid offense was, you know, was a how mummy. It actually started with uh, at BYU and, and, and with Mike Leach going there and, and how mummy being at his place. And they all came together. So how mummy came here to Valosta State as head coach in the early 90s. And so Mike Leach came through here. Chris Hatcher played football here. And, and, and it sort of started. And you'll hear them say that it's part of the disciple tree of the air raid offense. So now you have Mike Leach, who passed away last year. Mike Leach went to Miss, he was at Washington State, Texas Tech, Mississippi State. And he had coaches underneath him. Lincoln Riley was one of those coaches underneath him. And so Chris Hatcher played in that offense. And so he went on. David Dean was, was coached underneath that offense. Gary Goff, who's at McNeese Sta State, Coach with Mike Leach, coach with Hal Mummy. Now he has coaches going out from him. And so they say they're a disciple of that person. So they were learners of that. They were learners of the offense, the air raid offense. And so I, I use that because that's an example of how the world talks about disciples. So what does disciple mean in this church? What does disciple mean in Christ? And the best definition I found was this one by Bobby Harrington from dis, uh, disciples, uh, discipleship.org. And it's this. A disciple of Jesus is someone who is following Jesus, being challenged by Jesus, and committed to the mission of Jesus. I'll say it again. A disciple of Jesus is someone who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and committed to, uh, to, loss, to the mission of Jesus. So, following, changing, and to the mission. So I want you to ask yourself this question as we talk today, as we, we look at God's Word. Where are you at in this? Are you a follower of Jesus? Are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you a devout disciple of Jesus Christ? You know, Jesus told, as he was here on earth, he told, he, you know, he said a few times in, in John 17, 18, he says, As you have sent me to the world, so I sent them into the world. In John 20, he says, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So Jesus is telling the disciples, he's telling everyone that I'm sending you into the world. He's sending us. So we are being sent to the world as we're going to look at a little bit later on. See, the problem with us is, and, and, and I say us because I'm one of you. I'm not a pastor here at the church. I'm a, if you know Jesus Christ, you're a disciple. You can be a disciple. You can choose to be a disciple. Once again, you can develop that relationship. But see, we don't like everything that God's word says. We like treating it like a buffet. We like thinking about it like Mama June's or something like that. We like thinking of it that, hey, I'll take some of that. No, I don't want any of that. I don't like that. I don't want any of this. But I'll take some of that. I'll take two helpings of that. I'll take more of this. And I say that because, you know, I love worship. I love music. But just listening to, God, listening to worship music is not going to lead me to be a disciple. And if, you, and if you just, you know, go to a life group or you come to church on Sunday or you you know, you're just doing these things, that's not what's going to lead you to being a disciple. It's a little bit deeper than that, and we're going to look at that. We've got to quit being the buffet Christian. We've got to quit being the consumer Christians and saying, this is what, it's about me, it's about me, because it's not about me, it's not about me, it's about him. We've got to quit trying to say what's best for me, because God knows what's best for us. But we've got to get in his word. We've got to get on our faces before God. We've got to get around people who can encourage us to be a disciple and, and get to that point. So here we go. We're going to start and we're going to look at Matthew chapter 28. Where else would you go when you talk about discipleship? Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20. It says this. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Some doubted. Still that way today, huh? Jesus came near and spoke to them. I have received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey. Some versions say, observe everything that I have commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. Let's pray together. Father God, as we open your word, Father, as we see what your word has to say, Lord, allow it not be the words that I say, but, Father, allow your Holy Spirit to speak to each of us individually. Father, allow our hearts not to be hardened. Allow our hearts not to, to be thinking about other things, Lord, but just allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look at this passage, there's a couple of things I want to point out as we get started. The first thing is, is that it says that now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Now, how did they know to go to Galilee? 
I mean, you know, Jesus was, you know, had been raised from the dead, so how do they know? Well, you have to go back and you have to look at Matthew 26, 32. At the Passover, he says, after I am raised, uh, the Last Supper, he says, after I'm raised, I will go before you in Galilee. So he'd already told them, I'll go before you in Galilee. So we, we get that ironed out. And then it says, um, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So when we read this passage, see, we, we take passages and we read the God's word and we think it's happening like a movie. We, we think of it fast-paced. We think of it as that, all right, this, you know, Jesus, he, he came to earth, he lived just real quick life, and then he went, you know, he, they, they condemned him to the cross, and he went to the cross and died, he raised from the dead, and he went and he, and he saw Mary and Martha, and then he, he came back and saw the disciples, and then, you know, and then he went to the Mount of Olives, and he was ascended, he went, you know, when we think of it, it all happened really fast, but you have to remember that this happened over a 40-day period before he ascended to heaven. So, to say there was just 11 disciples that were there, I, I mean, I agree with a lot of the scholars that believe, as Paul writes in chapter uh, 15 of 1 Corinthians, he says that there were more than 500 there. So there was more people there than just, you have to remember, Jesus had been on earth for 33 years of his life, walking around, and people were coming to know him. People were having a relationship. They were going to see him. They were asking him to perform miracles. They were wanting all these things to happen. And so people were following him. People were going, you know, wanting to see so you can't tell me if, if he's raised from the dead, hey, he's going to be in Galilee where a lot of transformation and people's lives have been changed, that they won't go see what he was doing. I mean, heck, I was in Denver a couple of weeks ago, and Taylor Swift was in concert there. And, I mean, people from all over the country went to see Taylor Swift in Denver. You don't think that the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead, that people would get excited during this time and they would go to Galilee to see what this was all about? I can promise you they did. So there was... This large group of, you know, at least 500 people there. So it just wasn't a few. And it says there, it says, but some doubted. Even after he had gone to the cross, even after he had died, even after they'd put him in a tomb and put a rock in front of it, even after all this had taken place, some people doubted. Even after today, when people see your life change, when you come to a relationship with Jesus Christ, even after today, when people are, are being saved, even after today, when miracles are being performed and people are overcoming cancer, overcoming physical ailments, overcoming all this, people still doubt that our Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior. People still doubt that today, and it was the same in their day. The last thing is this, on this point, is that some worship and some doubted. So some people were to the naysayers. So how, how quick did this happen? I think this happened about between day 20 and 30 somewhere in that range, because you have to remember from Jerusalem to Galilee, and they were doing all this. They didn't have jet planes. They didn't have buses. They didn't have trains to take people. They had to actually walk. So you have to start figuring it out. So I think this was probably before the ascension, somewhere today around between 20 and 30. And not that that matters, but I just wanted to clarify that because I had to get that movie thing out of my mind. So as we think about this and we think about this taking place, I wanna, there's three points that I have for you today. There's three points. The first one is this. The first one is this. It's commanded for us. That's the reason I say discipleship dot, 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 not an option. It's not optional. It's a command. If we look at verse 18, it says this. Jesus came near and spoke to them. I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make. Go and make disciples. This wasn't like, hey, if you feel up to it, you can go do that. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. He goes on and talks about baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey the things that what? I have commanded you. So the command was given by Jesus Christ. The command was given to go and make. It didn't say go, and, it didn't say go home and wait. It didn't say anything else but said go and make and teach them to obey. In, in football... Anytime you're in anything that's organized, an organized activity, think of the commands. I mean, when you think about, you, you've seen the, you've watched war movies and things like that. Whenever a command's given, they have to follow it. Or, you know, things happen. You know, the only time we want to hear commands is if it's going to do something for us. We like commands that does something for us and makes us feel good. We like commands that, that does something for, to make us look better or what, uh, or, and things like that. It was a command given by Jesus to go and make disciples, teaching them to obey. 
You know, the one thing about this command that we sort of skip over is this, is that we have to jump back up to the beginning of verse 18 and say, read this. Jesus spoke to them and he said, I received all authority in heaven and on earth. Jesus had received all the authority. He's telling disciples to go and make. He's telling them to go and do. And he, you're talking to the guy who's got all the authority on heaven and earth. Jesus is sitting here today, but what do we know about, what did, what did God give us? God gave us the Holy Spirit. God gave us the Holy Spirit to enjoy. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the, all the power, the, all the authority. I'm not saying you're not going to suffer. I'm not saying that it's not going to be tough. I'm not saying that it's an easy walk. What I'm saying is that we've got a command to go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but yet we don't go. We sit. We sit. We become consumer Christians where we say, here I am, just feed me, feed me, feed me. And we just sit. We don't follow the command to complete. And I say this is that all authority has been given to Jesus. All the authority has been given to Jesus. I'm going to give you all a little spoiler. Y'all may not know this. How many of you like watching sports and stuff? You, you sit there and watch the Braves or you watch the football game, Georgia or Florida or whoever you're fan of, and you sit there and, and, and you, you know, I remember the Georgia-Ohio State game. I was there with Pastor David, by the way. But you sit there and you watch that game, and, I mean, he was... I don't know if y'all know this about Pastor David. I can talk about him. He's not here to defend himself. But I don't know if you know this about him. He loves Georgia football. I'm talking about He is psycho when it comes to Georgia football. And, I mean, Georgia, he's like, he's ready to go in the first quarter. You know, Ohio State's up by 14 points. He's kicking rocks. He's like, this is awful. This, they're not ready to play. We stayed the whole game. As you know, Ohio State missed the field goal. Georgia wins. Georgia wins 42-41. We know the ending. We had to wait to see it. But let me tell you this. I can tell you this about what's going to happen here on earth. Jesus wins. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait for the ending. You don't have to wait for the sequel. Jesus wins. It has already been decided. So why would we not follow the command of the one who already has, the, has won the battle, who's already paid our price? Why, don't, why do we keep sort of not following his command of going and making disciples? You know, when Jesus walked the earth, they asked him, Teacher, Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. He, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? They're trying to trick him. What does Jesus reply? You must love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your, your being, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this. You must love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. You must first do what? Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then you love your neighbors. And that takes me right into where I want to go next. And that is the commitment side of it. It takes the commitment, one, to Jesus and one to people. See, our command is not just to listen to receive. Our command is to listen to reproduce. To reproduce. Our command is not just to listen, just to sit there and say, that's great. Our command is to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them how to be obedient, teaching them, being an example. We saw the kids up here earlier. Those, those adults, those young people who go up there and spend time with those kids are making disciples upstairs. What are we doing? What am I doing? What are you doing to make disciples as we're commanded to go do? So our command is not to listen to receive. Our command is to listen to go reproduce. It's a commitment it takes a commitment. What is your commitment to? As, as we think about this commitment in verse 20, it says, teaching them to obey everything I commanded, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this age. It takes a commitment. There's, there's something about commitment. Commitment equals relationship. Commitment is a relationship. It equals relationship. I've been married 30 years, June 19th of this year. And I can tell you, it took a commitment. Because the world, it's easy, the world lets us out of commitments way too easy. The world lets us out, and so we just think that we can be committed to Christ one day and not be committed to Christ the next. We go in and we go out. We step in and out. But the commitment is a relationship. If you're going to have a relationship, if you're going to have a relationship with Christ, it means you have to spend time. I, like I said, I've been married 30 years this past June. When I started dating my wife, I was at the University of Georgia. She was here in Valdosta. My parents are probably watching. I've never confessed this to them, but I'll say it to y'all. 
I used to drive from Athens, Georgia to Valdosta on Friday. After I got out of class, I did go to class. And I'd spend the weekend down here because I was wanting a commitment to her. I'd get up Monday mornings at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, and I'd drive back to Athens and go to class. And I'd come back down here, you know, maybe the next weekend or vice versa. But it was a commitment. It was, I was committed to trying to grow that. How many of us are committed, that committed to our relationship with Jesus Christ? I mean, I, I, like I said, when you preach, when you study God's word, you talk to yourself, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to me. I can commit myself to so many things. I want you to think about the things you commit yourself to. You take your kids, you commit them to get them to school on time. Hey, school starts in another week. Everybody happy about that? Yeah, I bet the parents are. Hey, there's one happy one right there. But you commit to get your kids to school on time. You commit to pick them up from school. You commit to going to your job on time. You commit to doing the job that you're doing. You commit to get your kids to extracurricular activities, whether it's football, baseball, cheerleading, dance, whatever it is, gymnastics. We make all these commitments, and we can make time for all that, but we can't make a commitment to spend time with our Lord and Savior in His Word to understand what he wants us. We can't make disciples. We can't go and make disciples. We can't obey and teaching people to obey those if we don't have the commitment to him ourselves. We have to take that commitment. We, we make commitments to all this other, but the most important thing, the one who wins, we say, over here, I'll get to you. You're not, he's not going anywhere. He's going to still be standing there. We've got to make ourselves available. See, commitment is a relationship. And as I just read a while ago, out of that, uh, the, the greatest commandments, is commitment and relationship with Christ. You have to have that commitment and relationship with Christ. And then you also have the commitment and relationship to other people. How many of us are around other people? We all are. We all are around other people, and we commit to talking about all these other things, but how many people are we going to not see in eternity because of our lack of commitment? You see, I think many of us are excited about the kingdom. I think a lot of us are excited about the, you know, where we're going to spend eternity. I think a lot of us are, you know, man, the kingdom of God is going to be great. We lack commitment to the king. We lack the commitment to the king, to the one who came and died for us. We lack that commitment. We want to commit to all this other stuff, but we don't want to commit to the king. And that's why I say, and that as we look at the mission statement, it can develop that authentic relationship. It can, but it's your choice. It's your choice. You've got to decide if you want to grow in that commitment, if you want that to grow. Disciples were so committed that they went to Galilee to meet him, as we read earlier in the, in the chapter, in the verses there in, in uh, Matthew 28. They were committed enough that they went to Galilee to meet him because he said, I'm going to be there. And not only were they there, but they, as I mentioned before, other people were there. They were committed. They wanted to see what the risen Savior was going to say, what he was going to do. See, I mentioned that we're committed to all the things of this world, but we don't really want to commit to Christ. We don't want to commit to Christ because, I'm not saying we're scared, but it's like, it's inconvenient. It's inconvenient to us. I want to read this passage out of John chapter 14, verses 23 through 26. It says this, Jesus answered, whoever loves me will keep my word. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make, them make our home with them. Whoever doesn't love me doesn't keep my word. The word that you hear isn't mine. It is the word of my Father who sent me. I have spoken these things to you while I am with you. The companion, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you, and everything, will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I told you will remind you and will keep you of everything I've told you. You ever, going back to that can, that choice thing we talked about earlier, when you make a commitment, you got a choice whether you're going to follow through or you're not going to follow through. We have to be committed to allowing the Holy Spirit. If you feel that tug in your heart, if you feel Jesus speaking to you, you feel God, you feel God moving in your life, don't sit on your hands. Go and make disciples, teaching them to obey those ways. See, the biggest problem is that our commitment is interrupted by the enemy. There's nothing better than the, nothing worse than the enemy trying to disrupt our relationship with Christ. The enemy trying to put that wall, put that, that impede our relationship with Christ. 
The enemy wants that to happen. The enemy will tell us lies. The enemy will say, you got this sin in your life. You're not good enough. God doesn't want you. You know, I know what you did last night. God knows what you did last night. God doesn't want you. The enemy will go on and say, you're not good enough. You know, compare yourself to Brent Depta. Why don't you compare yourself to him? The enemy will tell you to compare yourself to David Rogers. The enemy will tell you to compare yourself to all these people. The enemy will say, you're a loser. The enemy will tell you all these different things to break that commitment. We know that the enemy, we know that Satan is a, like a roaring lion seeking to destroy, seeking to devour, seeking to tear apart. You know, in the last three years, and I use three years because we, that's what our new, that's the new standard now. You know, you have to go back three years. You have to go back to COVID. We, we define everything by COVID. But I believe, and this, y'all throw some tomatoes and tell David if you don't like it. I believe big C, not little c, the church has set the bar so much lower in our relationship with Christ and what it was. And I say that because technology and all these things have taken place. I mean, we, we know who wins. We know what the story is. We know the ending. We know that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. We know that we can have the Holy Spirit within us. We know that the second coming is going to happen. We, God's Word tells us that. We know all this is going to take place, yet we, our commitment still is interrupted. See, it, the scary thing is, is that you watch now on the news and everything. What's the, what's the latest and greatest? Thing? We don't watch the news, but what do you hear? What do you read? Artificial intelligence. You know, one day when Pastor David's out of town, there won't be anybody up there. It'll be like a hologram of him up here or something. But artificial intelligence is the new, the new thing, you know. I mean, you can go on this, and I'm still learning about it, and I know this group over here probably says, look, this guy's old. Chat GPTV, is that right? Did I say that right? Yeah, I look at there, all of them. How many, how many people know what that is in here? Chat GPTV. Yeah, see, all those old people are like, you know, is that a new TV station? Chat GPT Baird, which is by Google, what is that? Artificial intelligence. It's these platforms that are created. And all this stuff, you can, I mean, you can go in and type stuff, and it'll spit out this information for you. And it goes, and, it, and it's, it's all, and I'm going back old school. It goes back to the garbage in, garbage out thing when they first started inventing PCs, you know, the garbage in, garbage out. The only thing that artificial intelligence could, could really tell you was is that you put in the, the words and then it spits it back out. But what's happening now is they tell you is that artificial intelligence is what? They're starting to think on their own. Computers are starting to generate things on their own. So it's more important now that we stay committed to our relationship with Jesus Christ than ever before. Because the world is going to seek, destroy, and try to devour. That is what Satan's goal is, is to break that, that commitment that we have and try to tear it apart. So we have a command to go and make disciples. We have to make a commitment to go and teach people. We have to, you know, make ourselves available. The third point is this. It's continuous. It's continuous. If you look at the verse 20, it says, until the end of the present age. Until the end of the present, present age. If you go back and look at the parables in chapter 13 of Matthew, it talks about that Jesus continues talking about to the end of the present age, which is when Christ returns. And so the present age is not ended yet. It's still relevant today. Even though this was written 2,000 plus years ago, this is still relevant to us today. It's continuous. It's continuous. And it's continuous so that people... When you, we're being disciples of Christ, it doesn't stop. We don't reach the point and say, oh, job well done. I, I disciple that person, I can move on. My work here is done. Same way here at church. I watched this morning and, you know, and all the different things that take place to make this service go. All the different things. If you haven't seen it, it's pretty, it's pretty miraculous. It's pretty amazing when you see the ones who are doing the, the video stream the ones who are doing the words, the worship team in the back, the ones who are running the cameras, the ones who are in DPK, the ones who's making sure people feel welcome when they get here, the ones who's making sure the toilets work in the bathroom, the one who puts the podium here. You have all these things. It's continuous. If no one was here, if it just was going to happen, it wouldn't happen. Discipleship is continuous. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes these words to Timothy. He says, So, my child, draw your strength from the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
Take the things you've heard from me and say in front of many other witnesses and pass them on to the faithful people who are capable of teaching others. Take them and pass them on to faithful people who are capable of teaching others. We've got, it's continuous. You know, I, and I lived in Nevada for about 12 years, and I'll never forget this on the side of a school building in, the, in Reno, Nevada. I saw this. It says, 30% of the population, 100% of the future. That's what kids are. That's why they're in here this morning. That's one of the reasons for this fifth Sunday, as we're all talking about. It's so important for us to disciple our kids, to show them the relationship that we have. It's continuous. It grows in them. 30% of the population, but 100% of the future. That's the future church. We can't discount these kids. We need to be pouring into them. We get so caught up, you know, of wanting to be continuous and talk about going and making disciples of all nations, we don't go in our own backyard. We don't go to our own house. We won't go to the south side. It's so much easier for us to go and, you know, take that command and say, I'm committed, I'm going to go to to Thailand on a mission trip. And I'm not saying God isn't calling you on a Thailand, but make a mission trip right here in your own city, right here in your own church, right in your own county. Make that relationship, make that commitment to be a continuous disciple right here where you're at. Miles Fidel is pastor at Auburn Community Church in Auburn, Alabama. Miles Fidel said this, the primary way for you to make you a disciple is for you to go and make disciples. The primary way to make you me, yourself, a disciple, is to go and make disciples. I was like, when I heard him say that, it just sort of blew my mind a little bit. Because you cannot go and make disciple, go and disciple someone if you haven't studied God's word. If you haven't spent time in his word, spent time on your face before him and asked him to reveal himself to you. You can't fake it till you make it in discipleship. It's a true, it's a real, it's a living relationship living and breathing relationship and it's continuous the primary way to make a disciple is for you to go make disciples so make a disciple if you if you say i'm not ready you are ready if you have a relationship with jesus christ you're ready if you can talk and you can listen and you can love you're a disciple it's not my word it's the command of god go and make disciples where let's just say that if what, let's just say it's not continuous. So where will we be at? Well, would Peter have preached and thousands been saved? Would Billy Graham have gone all around the world preaching God's word? Would Charles Stanley have one of the large, you know, he passed, you know, both those guys have passed away and their ministry continues to thrive. And, th and it's not their ministry, it's God's ministry that continues to thrive. And it's not anything that they did, it's the people who came alongside them. Why do we love our church? We love our church, we love our pastor. But he can't do it alone. You see, discipleship's already taking place at Cross Point Church. Yeah, there's Flourish, there's DPK going on for the kids, there's men's Bible studies, but there's other discipleship. There's micro groups that are taking place that Pastor David started last year. He talked about them last year. He introduced that last fall, and it took place, and it's getting ready to take off even more. There's people being discipled in this church right now. There's, and when I say micro discipleship, it's one person discipling two people. And when that, that, those groups are done and coming this fall, get ready. Some of you are going to get asked. It's going to go ahead and give you a little spoiler. Some of you are going to get asked, hey, you want to be a disciple? But it's going to be one person on those two people. And after they finish, those two people. And the whole idea is to make disciples, to go and make disciples in this church. And from this church, in this community, and from this community, in this state, and from in this state, and in this world, baptize them. It's continuous. It's a continuous Thing that takes place think about if everybody in here got serious with their relationship with Christ and studied God's word and had two people that they discipled for six months and after that six months those two people got two and you got two more how would that look I encourage you in the coming days when, they, when you're asked you better be in prayer because God is wanting to do great things. And the enemy is going to try to seek and destroy. We already know that. I already told you that. Discipleship must be a continuous process to, keep, to complete the mission of Christ. The mission is not complete till when. The mission is not complete until the end of this present age. I am thankful for a man named Bob Burroughs.
Bob Burroughs discipled me in 1996. Bob Burroughs lives in Nevada. I don't mean to get emotional. Didn't do this first service. <laughs> but Bob Burroughs is a dear friend of mine. Bob Burroughs is now pushing 80 years old. Bob Burroughs is a man who was in produce business in Reno, Nevada. His family's in Reno, Nevada. was in the produce business. Took a calling on his life, went to seminary at Bob Jones University in South Carolina, went back to Nevada, pastor church, survived melanoma cancer. They told him he was not going to live more than six months. Survived melanoma cancer, went, to, went on to uh, start a Christian camp in Elko, outside of Elko, Nevada called Cowboys Rest Christian Camp. Bob Burroughs just returned from Ghana with a mission trip with his son at almost 80 years old. It's continuous. You see, we don't reach the point that discipleship stops. Discipleship continues. And I say that because we want to say, hey, look what I did, look what, you know, I've done this, I've done that. It's not about that. It's about Jesus. Jesus wins. Allow him to use you. So we have a command. We have the choice of making a commitment and we need to make it continuous. So I don't know very many of you in here. You don't know me. But as we get ready to close out here, I, I want you to do a, do a favor for me. We're all somewhere in the discipleship process. And I want you to recognize where you're at in that process. I want you to recognize where you're at in the discipleship process. You see, to, make a, to be a disciple... The first thing is you have to receive. The first thing is you have to receive. You have to receive the gift, the gift that God gave us, which is his son, Jesus Christ. We all know John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gift. So where are you at in the process? Is that part of, you know, are you, you haven't ever received Christ? Well, you're going to have the opportunity. You have the opportunity sitting right where you're at. Because you know what? Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, and the gift, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that, Jesus, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you're at that receiving point. Maybe you haven't received. Maybe you're saying... You know, I've thought about it. I've been on the fence. I mean, I like the world, but I mean, I like this thing that Jesus has all authority and that I can spend eternity with him. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you have a relationship with Christ. Maybe you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. But you said, you know what? I want to live in the world. I want to be part of the world. I don't really want to do this church thing. I don't love my church that much to, to be that. So maybe you've received Christ, but maybe it's time to repent. Maybe you've been going down the wrong track. Maybe you're hanging out with the wrong people. Maybe you need just to get on your face before God and say, use me. Take my life, God, and use me. 1 John 1, 9 tells us what? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe that's where you're at today. In Acts 17, 30, it says, The times of ignorance... The, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands us everywhere to repent. Maybe that's where we're at. God's going to quit looking ign overlooking ignorance. It's time for us to get right and get on our faces before God. So maybe you need to receive, maybe you need to repent, or maybe this is you. Maybe you just need to re-engage. Re-engage. I think about the, top, the first Top Gun movie, the original, you know, like, where, you know, where did he go? He's re-engaging, and everybody's so happy. But maybe it's time to re-engage. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you've taken a little break. Maybe you said, you know what, I'm tired of all this. I'm just sort of, I'm just sort of over it. Maybe it's time for you to re-engage in your relationship with Christ. Maybe it's time to re-engage in this discipleship process. James 1.22 says, you must be doers of the word, uh, must be doers of the word, not only hearers who mislead themselves. See, I think some of us sometimes get to, we, we like, you know, I've done my time. I've done my time in DPK. My kids are grown now. I've done my time teaching Bible study because I did a life group for four years. I've done my time because of that. 
Your time's not done because it's continuous. Discipleship is continuous. The church needs us to be continuous in our relationship. Yeah, maybe you need to take a few months off. Maybe you need to take a little rest. But maybe you need to re-engage now. Maybe it's time to re-engage because some of us become spiritually obese. We know where God's word is, what it says, who said it, what book it was in, what year it was written. We know all this stuff about God's word, and we just sit back and say, hey, those people don't know anything. One thing I do know, there's some people around here who may not know all that, but they know they have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and they fall on their faces, and they worship him. And so is that where you're at? Is it that time to re-engage? Is it time to get back involved? That's between you and God. Like I said in the beginning, can develop into an authentic relationship. So I ask this. Band's getting ready to come out and play. I'm done talking. But I ask you to allow God to shine his light on your life. Not Marty, not the pastors, not David, not the church. I'm asking you that the Lord Jesus Christ, let him take his spotlight. Let the Holy Spirit illuminate your heart and illuminate your life. And look in there. And I ask you this. I, I, I've already given away. I mean, I'm in my 50s. I grew up in a house one of those old houses, one of those cookie cutter houses that, you know, you walk in the front door and there's the living room and the kitchen's right there and dining room and you walk down, there'd be a long hallway right down it. And down that hallway would be bedrooms in the back and there'd be a bathroom, there'd be a closet. And anytime company came and or people came over, that closet was full of junk. Because my mom would take and pick all the toys or all the blankets or anything that we didn't want people to see and you cram in that closet and you shut that closet door. And that way nobody looks in there, you know, oh, that's the closet, the bathroom's next door. So as we come to a close and the band's playing, I ask you to do that. Recognize where you're at in the discipleship process. Maybe you need to open that closet door and get rid of some of that junk. Maybe you need to come and receive the gift of Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to repent or maybe you need to re-engage. The pastors will be down front. The altar's open. But let God speak to you. Don't let Marty speak. I'm asking you to spend some time praying. As the band plays, they'll tell you when to start singing. But I'm asking you to spend some time, just you and the Heavenly Father, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Let's pray together.